right in going. Okay, let's go ahead and begin with your first name, last name, stuff. Spell it all over. Sure, yeah, it's Janelle, J E N E L L E, Osborne, O S B O R N E. Janelle, thank you so much for joining me today. So, today's topic is going to be the candidate. So, you're one of the Lompoc mayor candidates, yes? Yes, absolutely. Right. I am running to be continue being the mayor for the city of Lompoc. So why are you running again? You know, um, it's been six years, but the past two years we've really picked up momentum. We've really begun to work together as a council. We've really started to be able to invest in the community, and I want to continue that. It's uh, a short two years, and there's still a lot of work to be done, and I'm excited about the progress we're making and want to continue. And Janelle, before we dive into that, tell me a little bit about yourself. What's your background? How long have you been in Lompoc? Why are you so passionate for the city of Lompoc? So um, we bought a house. My husband and I bought a house about 20 years ago here in Lompoc. Um, we came from Texas. My husband's job moved us to Santa Barbara. Santa Barbara never felt like home. Um, we looked at a house here, and the community really connected with my and my husband's uh, South Texas roots. It is an ag farming community, which we both grew up in. Um, it has a military base, which we both grew up around. And it's just a diversity community, despite being a small town. Um, so it was really comforting to come to. And then it allowed me to start my own business and really set myself up for success. And I began volunteering and asking questions about this community and diving into its history and thought it has so much potential and I want to help it get there. So I served on the Economic Development Committee for four years and then was asked to run for City Council, which I did in 2016. And uh, in 2018, midterm, uh, our mayor then, Bob Lingle, decided not to run again. And he suggested I run and the community asked me to do so. And I've been mayor ever since. And I just want to thank the community for the ongoing support, the ongoing trust they've given me, and the work I've been able to accomplish um, in the past six years uh, is just amazing, and we're beginning to see the fruition of it. Now, you know, what makes you qualified for this, you know, position? I know you've been in this for a while now, but what, what do you believe? So I, I think uh, first the community should understand that there, there are no qualifications other than you must be 18, uh, a registered voter, live inside the city limits um, to run for mayor. So the requirements are pretty simple, but I think it's important to come at it from the perspective of what is my lived experience and how can I contribute to that discussion about the policy and budget decisions that the council makes. For me, I'm a transplant, so I come from somewhere else and I've lived a lot of places, so I understand the value and the potential this community has because I have other places to compare it to, and it is amazing and is really a dream come true to live on the central coast of California in a community that feels this connected. The other part is I have a degree in history and public administration was one of my focuses. I've worked for large public institutions, whether it be a university or nonprofits, and they have similar issues and concerns. We're dealing with other people's money and other people's issues and we're trying to solve them as a group. And then I think working with other groups the council is a body of five members. It takes at minimum three of us to agree on a decision. So it's building consensus. And many of the jobs that I've had in the past are exactly that. I've worked as part of a team. I've led teams. I've worked on projects that required input from various departments, divisions, uh, different groups and entities. So it's really important to be able to listen to be able to listen to the community, to be able to listen to our staff, to be able to listen to each other on the dais, and then work together on a solution that shows we uh, can work together through compromise and concessions and ideas that really um, make sure that we're doing as best we can for as many as we can as we improve our community. And Janelle, I know there are some issues still to this day in the city of Lompoc. There's, I mean, there's, there's crime, homelessness, uh, you know, some some in the community are, have some issues with even the cannabis situation that's going on in the city. What, as mayor, you know, if you win, what steps will you take to combat these issues in the city of Lompoc? So you're absolutely right. We still have crime, homelessness, um, different 
opportunities in the community that aren't always seen as an opportunity by others. And I think part of it is to continue on the path that I've started over the past six years. And in particular, the last two years, what we've finally been able to do is fully staff the police department again. That's great, but we still need to go further and make sure they have all the equipment they need, all the training they need, retain these new hires, develop the relationships that are needed to combat crime and reduce gang and drug and gun activity. So those things have begun and my goal is to continue working on those, continue investing in our public safety department and making sure uh, police have the equipment they need, that the fire department has the new fire engines instead of running 30 year old engines. What additional training do they need, especially with with new industries like cannabis coming to our community that have a different structure or have different equipment that we might not be trained on. So it's really important to make those investments in the staff that are responsible for responding to those things. The homeless issue is a difficult one. I don't believe we'll ever eliminate homelessness, but we can definitely reduce its impact. And that's a partnership. The city can't do it alone. We have to work with the state, the county, and the federal government. We don't receive the funding, nor do we provide most of the services, but they affect our community. So we need to be at the table. We need to be a part of those discussions about where they're housed, how they're housed, Who's providing the treatments? Who's providing the services? Are they in our community? Are they here regularly in our community? And so it's been important to me to rebuild those relationships with the county and the state and the federal government in order to address those and make sure they're here in our community. But they're not treating our community as a place to deliver them to and then leave them isolated and not support them. So that's been improving. We've seen a, a stronger partnership with the county and a lot more of the funds being spent here for the right reasons and for the county to address our surrounding communities to also house homeless, have the transitional housing being built. So those discussions and those partnerships um, go beyond just the city limits and we're working on those. And then to uh, the cannabis industry, it's still in its growing stages. We have seen a great number of jobs come from it, a great number of buildings uh, be converted into businesses that had once sat empty. And you're also seeing the industry itself have a glut on the market and have difficulty maintaining the profit levels that they have seen for the past few years. So I think you're gonna see as we allowed it to be a free marking, Market, you'll see the cannabis industry itself um, determine who stays open, who stays in business by, by the quality of product that they're providing, by the quality of customer service they provide, by their ability to plan for and survive economic ups and downs. So I think there is a benefit to having gone cannabis-free market industry instead of it being a council decision and uh, potentially political involvement in something that is at danger of having bribery or tax evasion or um, determining who gets a chance to have success and this way it's the individual or the group that is working on it and I just ask the community to bear with it to um, look at it as an opportunity for um, additional tax revenue for our community additional jobs in our community and uh, we have many uh, tasting rooms and liquor stores and restaurants and bars. Um, so it is part of the new normal and we'll get through these growing pains together. And you know, Janelle, going back to the issues, I know you mentioned the police department and the budgeting and stuff. I know yeah. in the past the police department had some issues with short staffing and stuff. How is it going right now with the budgeting? I know you mentioned that you're trying to, or, or the city is trying to at least you know, build them up and make sure there the res there are enough resources in the department. With that being said, how is that going right now today? So I will say one of the huge benefits has been the re receiving of nearly $13 million from the American Rescue Plan. We're trying to use those uh, funds appropriately, meet all the requirements. And one of those areas is cost recovery from the pandemic. And we've been able so far with the first $6 million that we received, um, be able to justify it so that it's cost recovery, which has allowed us to put it into our general fund budget. And that we're using to address some of the one-time costs to get us back on track with purchasing new fire trucks. Even though it, we got one in, we, we went ahead and placed a purchase for another because both of our fire trucks were nearly 30 years old. So that second truck has orders been placed and it's on its way. Um, there's just 
supply chain issues with how quickly we'll receive it. In the police department, we've authorized the uh, purchase and updating of our 30-year-old uh, radios that are outdated and can't communicate with our mutual aid or even our fellow department heads in public safety like fire or fleet. And so we're working on that. And again, that's been approved and we're working through that, but again, supply chain issues. So as soon as it's available, um, they will be instituted and utilized. The police vehicles needed to be um, modernized and brought forward. They're driven 24 seven. They're uh, difficult to maintain on a regular basis. So we've started that, updating that and getting a new motorcycle for our traffic officer. And we're, looking at the next six million dollars and how do we move forward on the body camera issue because we all want it it's a huge investment not just for the cameras but for all the structure and personnel that go with maintaining all of that data that will be collected and then the requests for that data um, what else is needed in, in public safety as far as equipment or training? What is needed as far as retention? So these are all discussions that not only myself, but council as a whole are working on. And we hope that um, we put $4 million back into general fund reserve at the end of the last budget cycle, which was really important because during the pandemic, we were down to negative $200,000 when it should be over 8 million. So the goal is to put another 4 million back in at the end of this budget cycle. And that helps us become healthier. And then what excess funds are available that we can put aside and designate for the improvements that are needed. The police department has issues with its building where um, they are finally getting their air conditioning and heating fixed and running appropriately, but they're still having issues with their plumbing. The building is over 50 years old. Our fire department building, um, Station House 51, is a combination of housing that is well over 60 to 70 years old, and it's having its own issues. But we did make an investment there and purchase the equipment that helps keep the uh, exhausts and the fumes from our fire trucks from getting into the sleeping quarters. So we're doing what we can with what we can as soon as we can, but the goal is to do more. And the goal is to plan for it, to um, set aside the funds, to grow those funds so that we're not always having to lean on financing, but maybe have the investment ready to go for either matching funds on a shovel ready project, um, federal appropriations or state grants that come through. Again, it's being more prepared and having a fully staffed department, whether it's PD, fire, uh, parks and rec, any of the departments really helps us be more prepared, proactive, rather than nearly 10 years of being reactive and unable to meet those um, opportunities or expectations. And is adding additional personnel or hiring more personnel within the police department and fire department, is that a part of your goal, uh, Janelle, if, if you step forward and move forward as mayor of the city of Lompoc? Absolutely. What you've heard from our police and fire department is that they're running on a very tight team. And every time we have a loss, it causes another setback. So you have recommendations coming from your police and fire department about given a town of 44,444 people, what the appropriate staffing should be in each of those in order to, to respond appropriately to the demand, uh, whether it be crime or just emergency needs in our community. And we wanna get to that point where we're not running a bare bones or a minimum staffing based on 20 year old numbers. We have grown, we are going to grow. The Vandenberg um, Space Force Base is our neighbor. They're investing, they're expanding they're driving additional jobs and additional military personnel coming and so we will see an expansion we have 400 new homes being built above uh, the Y, 200 some odd new homes being built um, off of 7th and Laurel. So there will be growth, there will be new jobs, and we need to be able to respond appropriately and being staffed appropriately is part of that. In other departments, whether it's Parks and Rec or the Electrical Department or any of our utilities, we need to be staffed appropriately because we have retirements coming on the horizon. We have lots of employees that have worked for us for 25, 30 years, and I appreciate that. But at some point, they're going to want to retire, and we need to um, be ready for that retirement, not trying to fill the position once it's vacant. So hiring, making sure we're fully staffed, that people are learning the jobs before we lose all of this knowledge and experience is really important to a community being successful and 
really improving itself and uh, being a 21st century community. And Janelle, what are your two priorities if you win? So they will be to continue the momentum that we have. And one of those is investing in and improving public safety. This community not only deserves the safety, but needs to feel safe. So we've, we've hired, we're getting the equipment, we're working towards feeling safe again, but there's a lot of work that still needs to be done there. So priority number one is public safety. And then the second area is our Parks and Recreation Division. Our community needs opportunities, not only through the pandemic do we need to get outside, but we need to connect. And one of the ways you do that is through our parks and through our city events. There's some of the cost um, associated with participating in whether it's basketball, baseball, football, arts, uh, crafts are provided by city programs and at our city parks. So we really need to continue investing. We did a great job with the Prop 68 funds for Beatty Park and have the first all-inclusive park in the county. It is visited not just by our own community, but by others in Santa Barbara County coming to visit us there. We had uh, Congressman Carbajal set aside 1.3 million for Pioneer Park in the next appropriations. So we're looking forward to receiving that and getting started on improving that park. Park. That neighborhood, it's really everybody's backyard. And we really want to make sure that it's a safe area with modern lighting and modern equipment and safe playground equipment and work with the baseball community to improve the baseball park there. And then, of course, I would love to reduce the cost of some of our locations and some of the events that go on at those for the community and maybe fully fund them so that there were more days of free activities or more scholarships to those that um, find an impact of the current economy making it hard for them and their kids to get out and enjoy the community. So those are my two biggest priorities is investing in public safety, making sure it's staffed, retained, and present in our community and responding appropriately and that the community feels safe. And then parks and recs so that our kids and families have um, low cost and free opportunities to get out, connect, socialize, and become stronger and healthier. And how will you interact with other government officials? Well, as I have done all along, I will continue to build those relationships. Um, our dais is working together. We are respectful of each other, respectful of staff. We listen to each other. We try and work together. And that's a big deal over the last two years. So it was something I campaigned on in the very beginning, worked to um, ask for and improve. And then in the last two years, really begun to see a council of very different backgrounds, very different priorities, really work together to uh, support each other. The county, I have um, four of the Board of Supervisors endorsements. So I'm working well with the county and at the table in discussions about the different decisions they make that affect our community and want to continue building on those relationships. Some of those individuals are moving on to the state level, so taking that relationship to the next level, but also the relationships that, that I already have with our state represent representatives. Maintaining that, being a part of those discussions, visiting them there as well as when they're here, making sure they understand what our community is going through and the opportunities that might be presented to them to help us, and making sure they are um, giving us the opportunity to apply for some of these appropriations and grants in a way that we finally receive a lot of the support we need because we've missed out in the past due to those lack of relationships. And then the federal government is absolutely something I work on and I do it in more than one way. We have our own utility through our electrical department and that joint power association results in trips to DC where I get to meet with not only our local federal representation but many across the US that connect us and help us have a strong vital utility department. Those opportunities I take to visit with our local representation while in DC to advocate for additional issues. So I've been there on behalf of Vandenberg and the partnership the city is working on to support it and support its mission through supportive uh, utility issues or housing issues and communicating their needs. I've been to DC also to advocate on behalf of, you know, our parks and our recs and helping get that federal appropriation dollars. So I think it's really about um, maintaining a relationship, whether you agree with that politic, politician's politics, 
they're there and they're our representatives. So we need to have open dialogue. We need to connect with them, their staff, and um, regularly take opportunity to advocate for this community. And, and that's my goal, is to be its advocate and its cheerleader. And you know, COVID-19, yeah. it's, it's been past two years already. Right. Technically, we're still in the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Is that still a priority to you? Um, it's a priority for me to make sure everybody has what they need to remain healthy. So if you need masks because you're immunocompromised or you need assistance to um, attend our meetings remotely because you might be um, symptomatic or at risk of getting it, Absolutely, those tools need to exist and we need to make sure our community, our hospital, our health care are providing you what you need. If you have gotten your shots and you have gotten your boosters and you are confident that you're following protocol to avoid getting it, you, we welcome you back into the city council meetings, to community events, and to be supportive of those. And for those that are still dealing with um, understanding the pandemic and understanding COVID-19, the information is out there. Um, sit with your doctors, sit with your healthcare professionals, read the information that's out there, really do what's best for you and your family. But yeah, it is a concern because it is still mutating, it is still having various versions, and we still have individuals have chosen not to get the vaccine or can't get the vaccine, and we need to care for those. Again, it's much like the homeless issue, it's much like those um, dealing with the inflation. Um, those that need our assistance, those that need the most help are the ones we should be working to help because if we help those, we help all of us. And businesses now, yeah. local businesses, yeah. I mean, they were heavily impacted by yeah. COVID-19 yeah. uh, the most, and most of them had to shut down for the most part. How are you going to support, let's say, if you win as mayor, how will you support the local businesses who, let's say, are still struggling, or maybe they're not struggling anymore, but overall, on a community level, as you know, if you become mayor, how would you support your local businesses here? So what we have been doing is partnering with the different organizations who have funding available. So the microloans, which are being issued through the Chamber of Commerce, which we uh, fund, we provide funding to the Chamber of Commerce. They Okay, and we're back. All right, so we, as the city, we fund, provide funding to the Lompoc Valley Chamber of Commerce, which has the responsibility of delivering economic development on behalf of the city. They are partnering with the county, with local nonprofits that have received funding for loans, micro loans, providing workshops and connections with consultants for businesses that are still struggling or looking to recover. So I highly recommend any of those businesses reach out to the chamber, reach out to the partners that they are working with and the county to access that. Um, we are also trying to make sure that any of the rules that were temporary during the pandemic that are affected by our zoning ordinances or our um, rules on the books that we evaluate and see if there's some that should remain in place, whether it's outdoor dining opportunities or it is having parklets, whatever it is that a business has seen as helping it get through the pandemic, if they want to see that continue, we wanna work with them to make sure we update our ordinances and laws on the books to make sure that we can maintain that and empower them to be successful. Um, what I have seen is despite the pandemic, we have a lot of businesses that kept plugging along and going through the process and have opened their doors in recent months. And you see um, individuals coming in and investing either in property that already exists and needs a refresh and an update or new businesses coming to town. So while the pandemic was difficult on many businesses, both in town and out of town, I do see a resurgence. I do see businesses coming back online. I do see the community coming out 
going out to dinner, shopping locally, um, really trying to get out and support those local businesses because we don't want them to go away. We've, we've had years where businesses closed because of economic downturn and we never quite recovered from the um, downturn in the 2008, 9, 10 time frame. So I think we're doing much better than we were that time. I think we've learned a lesson um, from this experience and I just encourage everybody that if we shop local, dine local, if we support our locally owned businesses, it helps all of us and in particular um, really connects us as a community and that's the big difference between us and some of our surrounding neighbors. And anything else you'd like to add to this interview, Janelle? If you were to be mayor, you know, what else should the community know? Any message to the community, businesses, just the city of Lombok? Well, first I want to thank our community. They have trusted me with this position um, as mayor for four years on council for six. I love this community, and I don't just say that to say it as a political reason. I really... Um, find it an amazing community. I have lots to compare it to and as much as I travel on behalf of the city, as much as I go to Sacramento or DC or I go home to visit family in Texas, I always want to come back to Lompoc. I want to come back to the beautiful weather, to the caring people and to an amazingly run city. Our staff are uh, well educated, experienced, knowledgeable individuals. Our police department most of our officers live in town. They love this community and they want to see it improve. Our fire department is like family and they care for everyone that they call out to as if it was their own mother having an issue. And I just, I'm just very proud to represent this community, very lucky to do it and want to continue doing it and just thank the community for their ongoing support and look forward to spending two more years working to address um, our issues and continuing the successes we've begun to see. Janelle, thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much for taking time to get this interview done and I really appreciate it and good luck on your like the election this upcoming November. Thank you so very much for the time. I appreciate it.